All right, I think that that's working. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming today to the final installment of this semester of the philosophy seminar here at UQ. And today we have I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Jock McLaurin, who is uh, an honorary research fellow here with us, and he's a, a distinguished psychiatrist. <laughs> and I think that today he's going to tell us a little bit about philosophy and psychiatry mixed together. It's going to be an interesting kind of talk. So, oh, yep, go ahead. <laughs> Just I have to get my son to come yeah, and go, 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 check go. the screen. Uh, Sorry, wait, yeah. something's popped up. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry, it keeps showing dialogue boxes in the screen. Um, yeah, no worries. It's okay. um, I don't know how to switch these off. Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. So, all right. So then with that, maybe take it away, Joke. The, the floor is all yours. So I'm going to mute myself. Yes. Um, just can you switch off these dialogue boxes, please? That one and that one. I've lost the cursor. I don't know where it is. And that one. Right, now play. All right, terribly sorry about that, but these things happen. Yes, my name's Jock McLaren. I'm a, a psychiatrist now retired um, after nearly 50 years of practice. I've uh, been interested in philosophy for a long time, and I've published quite a lot of material. Uh, but this is the first time, first opportunity I've ever had to address the philosophy department in this basis. In fact, as far as I can work out, it's actually the first time in this country. So we'll have to see how it goes. Just to let you know, um, psychiatry is a medical specialty. It's governed in Australia by the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists background of psychiatry as we practice it today is in Europe and the US. In the US, influential figure was Benjamin Rush, who was a signatory of the uh, Declaration of Independence. And in the UK, Henry Maudsley, who established Maudsley Hospital. They were adamant that mental disorder is a, a biological disease of the brain. In, but they weren't the only ones. In France, Philippe Pinel, um, was a great liberationist. And in the UK, uh, there was a hospital established to moral treatment uh, called The Retreat in Yorkshire. And if you want to know how mental patients were treated in those days, have a look at this. This is a memoir, which is a, a, by all accounts genuine. Uh, it was apparently the um, material that was used by Dickens to write Oliver Twist. In fact, this is very, very much worse. If you look at that, then you look at, say, The Fatal Shore by Robert Hughes, which tells how prisoners and Indigenous people were treated. Then you get an idea of how mental patients were treated in those days. It was very, very bad. So what is mental disorder? It's essentially, it comes down to a social label. It's mental disorder if we say it is. And there are competing theories of causation, and there have always been competing theories. The oldest and biggest and probably the widest held today is still possession states. Practically everybody at some stage or other has believed that mental disorder is a result of possession by supernatural elements or supernatural forces in some way. The Romans also had a very strong moral perception of mental disorder, which probably came from the Greeks. Um, but they also were fairly clear, clear that biology had a lot to do with it, and everybody does. And there's this enduring idea in human um, society that uh, there's something we can add to the diet or subtract from it that will cure all manner of ailments and woes. And more recently, there's been the psychological perception, particularly Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic movement, and the behaviorists. <clears throat> Both of these were early 20th century movements, um, but they have declined since. Now get to the modern era, there are three competing models of causation, three forms of management, and all claiming to be scientific. There's the biological thesis, which is the biggest and strongest. There is a psychodynamic movement, um, which says that uh, mental disorder is the result of intrapsychic uh, factors, 
and then finally learning theory. Um, but at the same time as they were developing, there was in um, Vienna, uh, in the under the auspices of the Ernst Mach Society, there was a gathering positivist movement, and that was brought into very sharp focus in 1929 by publication of what's often known as the Positivist Manifesto. This was um, a 14 or 15 page document, which was entitled The Scientific Conception of the World, the Vienna Circle. And that was dedicated to Moritz Schlich. And in 1931, Schlich published another paper, which was uh, more or less an addendum or a response to that called the turning point in philosophy. And he said that philosophy has turned a, circle, turned a corner and it's very different. And they had the clearest ideas. And they said in this, their manifesto, neatness and clarity are striven for and dark distances and unfathomable depths are rejected. In science, there are no depths. There are only, there are surface everywhere. So they're telling us what's acceptable and what's not. The scientific world conception knows no unsolvable riddle. The scientific world conception re rejects metaphysical philosophy. Uh, metaphysical statements reveal themselves as empty of meaning, which reflected Wittgenstein's uh, concept that everything that can be thought of at all can be thought clearly. Everything that can be said can be said clearly. Um, not everybody was quite as impressed by them as they were. Werner Heisenberg said, the positivists, positivists have a simple solution. The world must be divided into that which we can say clearly and the rest, which we better pass over in silence. But can anyone conceive of a more pointless philosophy, seeing that what we can say clearly amounts to next to nothing? If we omit it all that's unclear, we will probably be left with completely uninteresting and trivial tautologies. Um, there's a powerful case behind that. So the fates of, and, and buffeted by this very intense movement, this the positivist movement in science, the fates of psychoanalytic psychiatry, well, it, it very much faded from the scene. There are still strong elements, but as a, a formal doctrine, it doesn't have anywhere near the impact that it once did. Learning theory didn't outlive its main exponents, Skinner and Pavlovian psych uh, psychology um, by Hans Eysenck in uh, London. Cognitive psychology as it was, um, I don't mean the research branch, has degenerated, well, no, has restricted itself to a technology called cognitive behavior therapy. Then there was a thing called an eclectic psychiatry, which meant that people could pick bits and pieces of everything to suit themselves. Um, but I wrote a paper in 1996, which said that this just licenses everything goes. And after that, that sort of got swept aside. And so all of these have gone to one side in um, as psychiatrists rushed to rejoin medicine as a positivist, uh, sorry, medicine as a positivist discipline. And the last skittle standing is what's called biological psychiatry. Now, the ethos for um, biological psychiatry is a very rigid positivist objectivity. Its goal is a complete reductionist account of mental disorder with no questions unanswered. If And so they, they adopt this um, point here, which and Wittgenstein put it, if it can't be put into words, we're not interested. The theoretical justification is what they call a biomedical model. And the research program is basic biology running in parallel with a major undertaking to try and classify mental disorder and also research programs in drugs and physical treatments. Now, the point about biological psychiatry is it, dicta it dictates physical forms of treatment, but there are no limits. It does not dictate limits to what can be done. So there's been all sorts of things done uh, under the uh, theoretical justification of this biomedical model. Um, we'll come back to some of them later. Uh, just briefly, the drive to rationalize psychiatry has been going full steam ahead for 75 years. Uh, in 1952, they published the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual number two, 
um, which came from the US Army Statistical Manual. And that was very, very much influenced by psychodynamic psychology. Uh, then in 1973, a group, it's the St. Louis uh, group in Washington University, published what they called research diagnostic criteria, and they were trying to put um, psychiatry into categories so that you could have a category of illnesses. And the goal behind this unstated goal was you would have your surface picture of the clinical picture that would then map down onto the genome. So each category of mental disorder matched, sorry, mapped down onto a specific genomic defect for which there would be a particular drug. That was the behind the scenes rationale. Over the years, the number of diagnoses has grown from 265 up to the latest one, 2013 DSM-5, 541 diagnoses in nearly a thousand pages. And it's generated a huge secondary academic and publishing industry, which is highly lucrative for the American Psychiatric Association. Now, biological causation is dominant these days. There was a meeting in July at the National Inst July 2009 at National Institute of Mental Health under the director of Thomas Insel. They dropped the chemical imbalance trope and replaced it with a concept called disordered neurocircuits. And they resolved then to create a framework for research based in genomics and neuroscience. We conceptualize mental illnesses as brain disorders that can be identified with the ordinary tools of, and they meant laboratory neuroscience, but they said clinical. They're gonna use genetics and clinical neuroscience to form the basis for this. Now, Thomas Insel was the longest serving um, director of NIMH. His, he was a psychiatrist, but uh, he had never practiced. He's made his name as a uh, research, laboratory research um, researcher, studying the brains of voles, which are nice little animals, sort of halfway between a rat and a mouse. They look rather like that. And he's, um, he left NIMH and joined Google and now has joined a startup. So um, he set the pace, but in 2015, in an interview, he said, well, while I was there, we spent about $20 billion and we managed to get a lot of cool papers published by a lot of cool scientists, but we didn't budge the needle on rates of suicide, rates of mental disorder, or rates of people needing to be on pensions. So he was having second thoughts about his program. Um, so how effective is biological psychiatry? Well, the answer is, when you look at the hard figures, it's not very effective at all, but it's very hard to get figures because a lot of them are controlled by the drug companies. So who cares how effective it is? Well, I think we do have to care. Mental disorder touches most of our lives in some form or other uh, at some stage in our lives. It might be just a relative is mentally disabled for a while, or it might be that we ourselves are seriously disturbed, seriously anxious, and eventually have to drop out. And so anxiety is still the most common cause of early retirement from the Commonwealth Public Service. Remember too, that people who are detained as mental patients in Queensland are totally deprived of their liberty. They have fewer rights than a convicted prisoner. In addition, there's the drug effects, which are serious and long-term. People are put on drugs and they stay on them for life. Um, there's also ECT, shock treatment, which is known to cause damage. That's why it was brain damage. That's why it was invented. Uh, the, the person who invented it, um, oh, what was his name? Maduna, uh, Laszlo Maduna, who was a Hungarian neuropathologist. And he developed the shock techniques because he thought that having diffuse brain damage would protect against uh, mental disorder. There's brain stimulation, which is roaring ahead. There's psychosurgery lurk lurking in the background. That will never go away. And the goal, uh, the cornucopia that um, they want is brain implants. And in addition, there's another which are, uh, factor which I see as pernicious, which is the increasing medicalization of society. And we mustn't forget the costs. The cost of mental disorder is huge. So the question comes, do psychiatrists know what they're doing? The statistics suggest that they don't. 
antidepressants are only marginally more effective than placebo. So I've spent my career searching for a viable theory or model of mental disorder. And the two that are available today are what's called the biomedical model and the biopsychosocial model. Um, now, the biomedical model, we've heard you've, the, um, the uh, declaration by National Institute of Mental Health in the US that they're going to cure or find the causes of mental disorder by looking down a microscope. There is very widespread acceptance of a biomedical model. And Daniel Stoljar, uh, as a philosopher at ANU, commented on this. That's Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. He says that we live in an overwhelmingly physicalist or materialist intellectual culture. The standards of argumentation required to persuade someone of the truth of physicalism are much lower than the standards required to persuade somebody of its negation. And I think that's absolutely true in psychiatry. You can get any paper published, you can get any research grant you like, as long as it's for physical research into mental disorder. In his um, little monograph, Physicalism, published in 2010, uh, Stoljar said, concluded after very exhaustive analysis, physicalism is either true and boring or interesting and false. And in 2013, I published a paper called Psychiatry as Ideology, which was the results of a survey of 10 years of the 13 most influential psychiatric journals looking for evidence of this biomedical model. The conclusion was it doesn't exist. There is no evidence whatsoever in the psychiatric literature that any psychiatrist or anybody has ever written anything that would amount to a formal model of a reductionist model of mental disorder. It's an illusion. So that only leaves the biopsychosocial model. And this, I must admit, drives me mad, probably drives a few psychiatrists listening completely mad too. In 1977, George Engel, who's a gastroenterologist in Rochester, New York, published um, a paper in Science called The Need for a New Medical Model, A Challenge for Biomedicine. And he said that we need to take into account biological, psychological, and social factors, because these are influential in disease. Now, he didn't address mental disease, uh, disorder specifically, and this has become very popular. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've wiped out, sorry, this screen has wiped out some of my quotes. You can read those quotes. If it's in bold, that's my emphasis. If it's in italics, uh, that's the emphasis in the original. So if you read that, it saves me, it saves my voice. And Bradley Lewis is a um, philosopher at uh, New York University. It's a bit unusual for a philosopher to write this sort of thing, but he's very lyrical there. Uh, there's another quote, which I now can't see because of, there's a, a bar in the way. Um, so Linda Gask is a very influential psychiatrist in the UK. She says it is and remains a model for the whole of medicine, not just psychiatry. Um, Frazier has said the BPS model is more relevant than ever. It should remain grounded in the biopsychosocial model. Um, and Ronald Pies is Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at Tufts University in Boston. He's also the um, editor-in-chief of a psychiatric journal called Psychiatric Times, which is a pretty hard-line biological journal. And he says that the biopsychosocial model um, has been the uh, standard for the past 30 years in psychiatry. Um, William Lugg from Sydney says it's the predominant theoretical framework. It's been around since the 1940s. Now, uh, the problem is the bi biopsychosocial model doesn't exist. Now, I published that in 1998. Engel named it, but he didn't write it. He, he said, we need a model that will do this. He wrote a name tag for it. He cleared a space for it in the library, and he put the name tag there. And that's all he did. He didn't write a word that would amount to a scientific model, uh, integrative model of mind and body. 
Uh, but ever since then, people have walked past that space in the library and they've bowed and scraped and tugged their forelock. Um, there's a few of us around the world screeching that this is just not on, this shouldn't be happening. The question then is, how can people endorse a specific model but also be unable to produce it? Or I've written to dozens and dozens of the psychiatrists, including all those that I quoted there, saying, could you please send a copy of the exact, speci uh, the specific um, items that Engel wrote, which says, this is my model. Not one of them has ever answered. Now, how can they do this? Well, it could be that they're right and I'm wrong. But if they're right, you would expect one of them would go, here, stick this uh, um, up your jumper. Um, but they haven't. The second possibility is they don't actually know what model means. Well, I think there's a very strong reason to believe that that's true. A uh, third one is that they're intellectually de desperate, which I think is also highly likely to be true. And then there's one item which is worse. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, there's a quote here from Carl Sagan, the astrophysicist, which I think is apposite, if you could read that. <clears throat> And bamboozle um, is a verb which is um, re a reflexive, um, which can be a reflexive verb. It's a transitive and intransitive verb. So you can either be bamboozle somebody or be bamboozled. And it's to cheat or to fool or to deceive. But the problem is psychiatrists are specialists who lock people up and drug them for life. And if you are through no fault of your own, detained under the Mental Health Act and compelled to take drugs in the very long term, you will die 19 years younger than if you hadn't had those drugs. That's for Australia. All right. So the dr treatment takes 19 years off your life. This is a drug effect. It is not a diagnosis effect. In the US, where they use polypharmacy much more than even in Australia, and larger doses of drugs are more common, that figure is 25 years. So psychiatrists need to know what they're doing. If they're going to take 19 years of somebody's life, they need to be sure what they're doing. Now, the worse, I mentioned worse a minute ago, is it to bamboozle or is it to defraud? The Queensland Criminal Code says that a person who dishonestly gains a benefit for any person commits the crime of fraud. They specify the benefits very broadly. Um, and further on, they specify aggravate, uh, sorry, the, the criminal code specifies aggravating factors that the offender carries on the business of committing the offence. That one is very important. Be um, there is one let out though. If you genuinely believe uh, that that something is true and you act on that and gain a benefit. That isn't fraud. So if you make, uh, have an honest and reasonable but mistaken belief, you, have a, you, are, you get a um, get out of jail card free. But the question is, psychiatry has ignored 25 years of warnings. Um, I don't believe they can claim that this is an honest but reasonable mistake. So I'd like to say, while they be a biopsychosocial model, the problem is that means psychiatry is now operating without a scientific warrant. And so we go, as I said, we go back to the search for a viable theory or model of mental disorder. And it must give account to the model, to the reality of mental states. Why must it? Uh, why can't we just stick with the positivists? Uh, because I think that uh, mental distress is real. Um, and only people who have never suffered think it isn't real. If a person suffering from a severe anxiety state, that is very, very real, and it must not be underestimated. So in order to explain mental disorder, we need to give an account of cognitive functions, which is the easy problem of consciousness. You'll be familiar with that expression. The ex uh, experience or um, the experiential side of mental life, which is a hard problem, we need to account for psychosomatic interaction. That's very important and to free will. And the only means of understanding is to have um, a grasp of the mechanism by which mental life is generated and the medium for implementation of mental life, because nothing else can tell us where it goes wrong. 
uh, if you don't have that, then you have to forced back into an ideological position like the behaviorists, um, like Freud, who said that it's, you know, it's all psychological or above all, like the biological psychiatrist who simply announce ex cathedra that all mental disorder is biological. So what's philosophy to, uh, got to offer? There are two major themes. There's the reduction or monist theme. So there's a causally effective mind, which can be reduced to its physical substrate with no questions unanswered. And we'll look at a number of authors there. Then there's an emergent or dualist mind. There is a causally effective mind and we can work with it, but we either need not explain it or can't explain it. There's a couple of names there, Ryle and Davidson. I put Chalmers there because he is, you know, probably the preeminent dualist today. Um, but he says we, you know, hopefully we can explain it. So monism versus dualism, the crux of dualism, this is very important, is an apparently unbridgeable gap between two incommensurable orders of being um, that must be reconciled if we wish to justify our assumption that there's a comprehensible universe. That's Richard Watson, also from Washington University in St. Louis, uh, writing in 1995. Now, um, we get to John Searle, we'll start with John Searle. He takes a um, pretty strongly biological line. He says, if you um, think that there's a mysterious kind of, consciousness is a mysterious kind of phenomenon, uh, then you're adopting dualism and dualism in any form makes the status and existence of unconscious of consciousness utterly mysterious. He says further on, um, science will be able to solve the problem of consciousness. So that's his, his um, ethos. He says, given the constitution of reality, consciousness follows. Uh, and he gives mitosis, meiosis, photosynthesis, and they always mention the secretion of bile. It just comes up time and time again. People always pick on the liver. So he says the mind is essentially a biological phenomenon, but that actually follows from his view of the constitution of reality. Therefore, everything else is biological too. Once we see it's biological, it can be investigated neurobiologically, which fits in very much closely with what Insel was saying at the NIMH. Insel uh, moved to California, of course, when he uh, left the NIMH in Bethesda, in Maryland. And as far as I'm aware, he and Searle do talk. So that's possible. It's not coincidence that I'd say. <coughs> But they didn't, but Searle didn't know about Norbert Wiener, the rather eccentric mathematician, uh, who said the mechanical brain does not secrete thought as the liver does bile. He says, it doesn't put it out in the form of energy as the muscle puts out its activity. Information is information, not matter or energy. And materialism has to acknowledge this point. That's in his book, Cybernetics. Um, or control of uh, animals or, and humans or something. And in that, he defines a dualist universe. Information is not matter or energy, but information, as he made clear in this book, um, information can control the physical universe. So Searle has no theory of mind. He didn't offer a formal theory of mind. He says what? He talks a lot about what the mind can do, but there's no actual theory. Certainly no mechanism by which the mind is generated by the bio biological brain, no medium of implementation. So his work, I'm afraid, is of no value to psychiatry. We move on. Chomsky. Uh, two very important works, The New Horizons in Philosophy of Language, I think it's called, and Why Only Us, which published in 2016 and is probably his last major work. Chomsky, language is very important in psychiatry, so Chomsky gets a Guernsey. Language, he says, arose 60 to 80,000 years ago by a chance mutation causing a slight re rewiring of the brain. And he's quite emphatic. There were no languages prior to this event 60 or 70,000 years ago. There is no room in this picture for any precursors to language. He says it's a genetically determined cognitive organ of the body. 
this mental organ is a real object to be studied in the same way as other physical objects. He's not concerned with intentional attribution. Dualism, which I can't read, is prevalent and pernicious. Uh, mentalist talk will fade away. He's quite clear on that. So he's opposed to behaviorism, we know, because of his incisive and really quite devastating critique of Skinner in 1956. He's opposed to dualism. He splits mental life in two and embraces the cognitive element only, which of course we will hear later is the easy problem. Cognitive functions, Chomsky specifically says, reduce somehow to the brain. The rest can be left to poets and philosophers, he says. Unfortunately, his evolutionary talk is incoherent. There is no conceivable way a single mutation could result in um, the sudden appearance of developed language and spread to involve uh, to um, be part of the genetic heritage of every human alive today. That is simply impossible. But he also invokes emergence, and emergence is, guess what, dualist. So he has no model of mind sufficient to explain mental disorder. He hardly ever mentions it in his writing. I should point out, of course, that Chomsky is one of the most prolific authors alive, probably if not the most. And he's published over 150 books and innumerable lectures, papers, articles, commentaries, videos, etc., etc. And he's still putting out videos and interviews at 94. So we move on to Daniel Dennett, um, as, as far as reductionists go. <clears throat> he endorses functionalism, which says that mental states can be characterized by their role in the total behavior or function of the individual. I must admit, I do not find that plausible or convincing. Again, a prolific author. These are some of his most important works. The last one on the list there, 27 and 2017, from Bacteria to Bark and Back is probably going to be his last substantial work because he's in his 80s and his health has been pretty poor. Um, but he's still producing, you know, he's still talking. He says, and he may, this is a question he asked um, a few weeks into his philosophy, first philosophy course when he was 18 uh, and at his liberal arts college. He said, how on earth could my thoughts and feelings fit into the same world with the nerves and cells and molecules that make up my brain? And he decided then that they can't. So his life goal has been, as he says, constructing a theory that is not dualism in disguise. He wants a materialistic model of the brain as, as the mind. So the brain as the mind. He argues that using recent scientific progress, even doubters can take seriously the prospect of a scientific materialist theory of their own minds. Somehow, the brain must be the mind because accepting dualism is giving up. And he is quite um, he, quite contemptuous of uh, dualism. He says um, dualism is... Um, Oh, he says here that the lurking suspicion is that um, people want it to, because it's mysterious. If dualism, the best we can do, we can't understand human consciousness. Other times he's called it ectoplasm or wonder tissue. Uh, you can read those few quotes there. Um, it's you know, unusual to see a psychiatrist, so see a philosopher um, be so disparaging about the opposition. It's very unusual. But I think part of that, too, is that Danette really isn't writing for professional philosophers. He's writing for undergraduates. And I think he's trying to convince them very early. Um, but anyway, that's a different point. So his stance is that if consciousness is physical, then it evolved. But in order to justify this, he uses vast amounts of biological material, which is all carefully cherry-picked, there are many rhetorical ploys. He succeeds in explaining vision as um, biological, but it fails with language and the core mental functions. One of Some of his ploys are, look, here, Ponce had an idea in his mind of the fountain of youth, we might say, loosely speaking. But the ne um, so he's saying, oh, you know, just uh, there's a bit of hand waving going on there. Later, 
uh, he is not loosely speaking. He uses that deliberately as though he's already explained it. Further, he goes down, what minds do is process information. And he gives a list of the informational functions of, of the mind. Uh, mind is fundamentally an anticipator, an expectation, an expectation generator. So now he's moving into the realm of information. The mind is an informational organ. And in order to complete this, he invokes virtual machines as the final explanatory link in his account of mental life. Uh, you better read those. I'll have a drink. And this is very important. Um, he, he continues. Um, this one here is critical. Human consciousness is itself a huge complex that can be understood as the operation of a von Neumann-esque virtual machine. Uh, Johann von Neumann was a Hungarian-born mathematician um, who went to the US uh, and was one of the cardinal um, theorists in uh, the IT revolution. All computers these days, except very specialized ones, use von Neumann architecture. And he developed all of that. Uh, and so the human consciousness as a system of virtual machines, we are transformers. That's what a mind is, as contrasted with a mere brain, the control system of a chameleonic transformer, a virtual machine for making more virtual machines. Problem, um, sorry, he's totally dismissive of the idea that emotions count. At one stage in kinds of minds, he says that if I stamp on your foot, it will just cause a brief negatively signed experience. It is risable to refer to that as suffering. He's dismissive of emotions, which is consistent with the positivist ethos. If we can't see it, if we can't put our fingers on it, it doesn't exist, it's not science. But the problem is he is utterly reliant on the concept of a virtual machine to complete his, quote, materialistic model of the brain as the mind, but virtual is as virtual does. The word virtual means not real, insubstantial, unlocalizable, not subject to the laws of physical realm. And a virtual machine constitutes an incommensurable order of being. Um, so he has, in fact, constructed a theory that is dualism in disguise. Sure, he stripped out the biological, sorry, the um, uh, metaphysical language. He does that. And he replaces it with biological talk and um, IT babble. But underneath, he's still using this concept of something which doesn't exist in time, in the time space matrix and is not subject to the laws of the physical universe uh, in order to complete him. C'est seulement le dualisme de M. René Descartes à la mode. This is only Descartes' dualism à la mode. That's all he's done. And the source of his error is the von Neumann-esque virtual machine. This is what I'm, this, sorry, this is my interpretation of his, of his ghastly era. He's saying, um, we can set up a, um, a virtual machine in an ordinary desktop computer. Everybody knows that desktop computers are, um, do not have second substance, secondary substances in them. They are just very strictly subject to the laws of the physical universe. So that means that um, the virtual machine is subject to the laws of the uni physical universe. Therefore, virtual machines are not dualist. Therefore, if I set up a dualist, uh, sorry, a virtual machine in the human brain, it's not a dualist explanation of mentality. I think that's what he's doing. Um, and just remember, we haven't even started on memes. Stephen Rose, um, who's the Emeritus Professor at uh, Open University in London, said that um, bacteria, um, Danette's last book, back to, from ba Bacteria to Bark and Back Again, he said it's an infuriating book. And he said of memes, when you read about memes, you don't know whether to burst out laughing or to start banging your head on the wall in despair. So well, me, I think he's very polite. I think memes are actually worse than that, but we won't start on that. So go to just now the thing is, has Danette just made a mistake? Is it just an unfortunate error? Or is there some more systemic error in the concept 
of reduction that we need to explore. So we'll go to a very hardline reductionist, uh, Richard Carrier. You may not have heard of him. He started life as a historian uh, of Greek or Roman culture and Middle Eastern culture, and then start, developed an interest in religions and is now on an anti-religious crusade. He says, I am a first order physicalist. Everything that exists is physical. I must be able to reduce moral facts to physical facts in some way. You read on. Remember, uh, if it's in bold print, that's my emphasis. So, so this next, this second quote here is the reductionist credo. Theoretically, all of sociology and psychology can be described entirely by physics. Um, he says, but then he says, after having put all that in, he says the word mind refers to a particular pattern of brain content and activity. Now, hang on, hang on. Here you're making a, a lunge for information but we've already got it on a reliable authority that information is not matter or energy. Then he says, that's what consciousness actually is. The brain creates fictional models and the brains, and then we see it here, it comes out again. The brains of all higher animals are virtual reality machines. The human brain also constructs a more, an even more astounding virtual construction, that of a self. So again, he has invoked a virtual machine to take account of information. And I think that is the systemic error of reductionist, um, of all attempts at reductionism. They will always run into this. I think this is um, the point of uh, Daniel Stoljar's work. He didn't put the same emphasis on this as I'm doing today, because he didn't, you know, these people hadn't actually published this work at that stage. But um, I think that this is a mistake that will always happen. Reductionism, rigid reductionism, positivist reductionism will always end up with a loose thread called information. Information is not matter or energy, it is dualist. And the only way they can get around it is by invoking a dualist machine, smuggling dualism in to their reductionist positivist model. So in the final analysis, I'll put it to you that no physicalist account of mind can be completed without invoking information. Information operates on non-physical laws. It constitutes an incommensurable order of being, which is incapable of reductionist analysis. So dualism doesn't mean two substances. It means two sets of laws. Without a theory of information, there can't be a, theory, a monist theory of mind. So I'd say that positivism fails. So there are other plenty of people who have accepted the reality of mind uh, and they work from there. Gilbert Ryle is one. When I studied philosophy a long, long time ago, 45 years ago, uh, Ryle was one of the most influential figures um, we had to look at. Uh, you can read these quotes quicker than I can talk them, or speak them. So he's saying um, mental life is real. Uh, it can, the mind can influence the body, um, but we need a special explanation. So he asks, how can a mental process cause movements? How can it, uh, a light affect the perception? And he is critically important. In some ways, which must forever remain a mystery, mental thrusts, which are not movements of matter in space, can cause muscles to contra contract. Um, so then he says, but we, in order to explain this, we've got to stick with the positivist ethos, which is that only observable Day, uh, um, events are the right and only manifestations to study. So he restricts the evidence and he says, my way of finding out about myself are the same as my way of finding out about you. He has no theory of mind. He uses the mind without an explanation. He often talks about the mind. He talks about jingles running through your head or music, hearing music in your head. He talks about seeing in visions from times past. He has no concept of mind-body interaction. He says we will never understand it. 
The section he wrote on emotions is actually incoherent, but fair enough. It's 75 years old. He had no biological training whatsoever. And our understanding of emotions in those days was primitive to say the least. It's just marginally less primitive now. So unfortunately, Gilbert Ryle is of no direct value to psychiatry. Donald Davidson, I think is, but I don't think he would he had intended that way. There's an important paper um, that uh, from 1970, and it's been called the most, dis most debated paper in the philosophy of mind of the 20th century. Um, sorry, I'm just going to read that. He invokes three principles, and the, the principle of causal interaction says that at least some mental events interact causally with physical events. Okay, so there is mind-body interaction. Principle of nomological character of causality, he liked big words. Where there is causality, there must be a law. Events related to cause and effect that fall under strict deterministic laws. And then we have this um, principle called the anomalism of the mental, but there are no strict deterministic laws on the basis of which mental events can be predicted and explained. So he says, we've got to, these are real. He said, these things are real. We've got to make sense of them. Did he? No, I don't think so. Um, he uses the concept of mind. He says, beliefs are real things. Then he makes this very bold claim. Truth is one of the clearest and most basic concepts we have. Uh, it's very brave. I think that's rather brave. But here is where it gets important for psychiatry. Nothing can count as a reason for holding a belief except a prior belief. So that's a dualist statement, a statement of dualism. And the justification for a belief cannot come from outside the system of beliefs. So he's a coherentist. He says that the truth of a statement is justified by the truth of the statements in which it's embedded. Um, and this is pretty important. Uh, he says, nothing in the world, um, no object or event would be true if they were not thinking creatures. And that's actually a truism, but it points to a theory of information. And this is the first time we've come across this. So I'd ask him, well, can you please explain ridiculous beliefs, you know, like um, uh, somebody who thought he won an election when he didn't win an election, um, or contradictory beliefs, like people um, who support one particular party without realizing that that's also damaging them. And he says, all beliefs are justified in this sense. They are supported by numerous other beliefs. And we have a presumption in favor of their, their truth. So there's no belief um, without a presumption in its favor. So he's saying beliefs are information. The trouble is, if you don't allow um, some external justification of your belief system, you lead, you end up with infinite loops of belief with no beginning and no independent confirmation. So I think that there's, we can modify that slightly and it becomes of immense value to psychiatry. So beliefs are nested in um, or are subsets of broader, cruder beliefs. So we've got a belief here, it's, it sits in an underlying belief and that is broader and cruder and that sits in a broader and cruder belief. And so you can track back along the beliefs till you get what we could call the Ura beliefs, which are, I exist, the world exists. Where did they come from? They came from sensory input and in infancy. So beliefs go back a long, long way. And this, this immediately leads to the um, a justification of the concept of isolated or contradictory beliefs. And uh, so if you've got belief system, belief here, it's got three sub beliefs in it. They are not the same. They're slightly different. Each of them can then lead to further beliefs and they diverge. And out of that, you can end up with um, contradictory belief systems. So I think uh, and that is probably the best account available of the psychogenesis of paranoid states. Biological psychiatry, of course, says that paranoid states are biological. They can't explain that. They just believe it. But I think that Davidson's um, work in beliefs uh, gives us an entry point to a psychological account for paranoid states. So we'll leave that. We'll go on to David Chalmers. I'm just about 
running out of time and voice. <clears throat> Chalmers, as you know, talks about natural dualism. He says the concept of consciousness is irreducible. It arises from an intact brain by natural processes governed by the laws of what he calls laws of supervenience, which we can understand one day. This leads to a bi bicameral account of mind. He's got a psychological or computational mind, which he says is the easy problem. We've got uh, things, you know, like these things here. These all operate on the same principles as the computational mind. And then we've got the phenomenal or experiential mind. We've got to give account of the fact that we can see, hear, feel, smell, taste, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that he says is the hard problem, and it's not going to go away. And Danette, as you heard, tries to explain it away. He doesn't try and explain sensation; he wants to explain it away. And Chalmers says you can't. In fact, Chalmers and Danette have this um, back and forth debate, which has been going on for many years, which is quite interesting. Um, so he's recently published a book called Reality Plus on virtual worlds and the problems of philosophy. Uh, and um, I had to go through that. It doesn't add to his thesis at all. In fact, if, if, if um, bacteria to bark and back again is infuriating, this is worse. If bacteria to bark, bark was directed at undergraduates, this is directed at bright but very irritating 14-year-olds who like computers. I think it's a terrible idea. Um, and it, in order to establish his case, Chalmers relies very heavily on an argument called zombies. A, a zombie is a living human with no conscious experience. He says there's no contradiction in the ideas that... Um, there could be a physical structure that's atom for atom identical for Donald Trump, to Donald Trump, but is not conscious. I think that's probably, a, you know, sort of on the verges of bad taste, that, that example. But anyway, that's one he uses. He also talks about his zombie twin. His zombie twin is molecule for molecule identical to me, but he lacks conscious experience entirely. I have grown quite fond of my zombie twin. There is nothing it is like to be a zombie. And he adds... I confess that the logical possibility of zombies seems um, obvious to me. I can discern no contradiction in the description. It comes down to a brute intuition. Uh, and um, this is a bit of a problem because um, if you look, he's been talking about this for decades. And I'd say he's probably been thinking about it since he got his first computer at the age of 10. You get all of this information in that recent book, Reality Plus. <clears throat> and he's, play, he's lived and breathed computers and computer games ever since. He is a mathematician, as you started his career as a mathematician, as you probably know. Uh, and he's dreamed about zombies for, you know, nearly 50 years. And so when it comes to a brute intuition, well, Descartes believed in God with all his heart and soul. Um, and that was a brute intuition too. So I don't think we need to give much credibility to um, Chalmers' brute intuition. But the Polish philosopher and historian Leszek Kolakowski said, there is no idea so obscure that somebody, after having used it for a long time, could not come to regard it as self-evident. <laughs> I think that nails zombies. Um, when we go, if I just go back to that one, uh, Donald Trump. Yes, if there's an uh, an atom for atom uh, human who is identical to Donald Trump and is not conscious, then I'm afraid it's dead. As far as a zombie twin goes, if it's a molecule for a molecule identical to me and it has no conscious experience, then it's not identical. There is a block somewhere. It's not identical. It's either dead or it's not identical. So much for zombies. And that means a very large part of his um, argument collapses. And he, he would have been better off sticking with information theory, but he didn't. <laughs> now, the laws of supervenience, he doesn't say what they are. And I should point out, of course, that he has no theory of information. How do we know that? Because if he had, he wouldn't have invoked zombies. He would have used that. Uh, I think in terms of the laws of supervenience, we should look 
to um, George Boole's Laws of Thought, published in 1854, which are the rules for a, um, a, a binary logic. And I think that they amount to the same thing as Chalmers' Laws of Supervenience. So this, I don't know why Chalmers hasn't um, said this. I contacted him and asked him, did you ever consider this? Don't get a response. Um, it's the story of my life, actually. <clears throat> anyway, so this leads to an emergent dualist model of mind, which is ipso facto, because it's information, not amenable to a positive, positivist account. So can there be a positivist psychiatry? Oh, this is my last slide. You're lucky. Can there be a positivist psychiatry? Psychiatry deals in emotions and beliefs. Emotions and beliefs are real. Pain is real. If you stamp on somebody's foot, as Danette uses that example in Kinds of Minds, that is a real thing. Torture is real. Rape is real. Persecution, um, repression, they are real. And psychiatry has to deal with these. If the science can't cope with them, then your science is anemic. Um, functionalism and cognitivism dismiss emotions and beliefs. They focus on the easy problem of consciousness and they forget the hard, they just turn their backs on the hard problem. I will put it to you, there is no possible account of mind that doesn't include information. A mind devoid of information is contradictory, inherently contradictory. Um, information is dualist, therefore a positivist account of psychiatry and fails and indeed all positivism, in my view, fails. And I thank you for that. Uh, just the last slide, I'll put it up here, just, um, uh, so, just so that it's sitting there and we can talk further if you wish. Uh, Guillermo. Uh, 